All right. Well, here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Empath Superpower Masterclass. I'm so excited to have everyone here. And if you're watching in the future, I'm glad to have you here as well. My name is Brittany. Oh, Lord. My name is Brittany Porter. <laughs> And I am an ascension coach and energy healer. And I love working with empaths. I'm an empath myself, light worker. Uh, when I first started on my spiritual awakening journey, I did not know that I was an empath. And I always wondered why I didn't fit in and why I was so quote unquote sensitive. And other people around me didn't get that. And then the further I got into my journey, I realized like, oh, I'm not the only one that feels this way. Sometimes we feel very isolated from one another. My notepad, I'm sorry, it keeps falling over here. We feel very isolated from one another. If you don't have a lot of empaths around you or maybe even neurodivergent people, they kind of like go hand in hand, hypersensitive, uh, highly sensitive, uh, but it can be a lonely journey. And so I wanted to put this presentation together. And so, you know, there's other people out there <laughs> can help you understand your gifts because a lot of times we see it as a curse. Um, if we're not sure how to utilize them towards our benefit or the benefit of others. And so hopefully this class will help you see it as a superpower. All right. So we are going to be chatting for about an hour and then we'll have 15 minutes afterwards for Q&A. And I have some extra resources for everyone's journey that kind of extend out past just being an empath as well. All right. Okay. So I don't know if anybody has ever felt this way before. I used to in the past a lot in past be like, I'm so confused. I love and care for people, but I don't like being around them. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody else feels that way, um, but that was definitely me at the beginning stages because it was just so overwhelming being around people because we feel their thoughts, feelings, and emotions and stuff that's going on in their subconscious. And it's just a lot. <laughs> And so if you're newer to holding boundaries or shielding, this is something that you can, I don't call it like turning down, but it's something that you can kind of um, just reset your energetic field that's around you to not absorb so much. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, let's see here. Hilarious. Same in nurse here. Yeah. <laughs> Especially like a nurse or anybody who's in like customer service. <laughs> Anytime you're an empath and you're around people that are like upset in your workplace, that can be very overwhelming too. Uh, like working in like the mental health field, customer service, nurse, things of that nature. How do I? Maybe it'll go down. That's fine. All right. How do I get? All right. It'll just stay up. It's fine. Okay, so first we're going to talk about energetic signatures. So a lot of times people want to come and tell us all the things that are going on in their life, which that's great. We're very supportive. We have compassion in our hearts. We want to like help everybody that we can. That's part of like being a light worker, right? But sometimes that's very overwhelming and we'll get into why that is. But we can pick up on trauma in people because a lot of us have had trauma ourselves. Sometimes you are born an empath and sometimes you have empathic abilities come on because you've experienced so much trauma in childhood. It's made you like so hypersensitive as a safety mechanism. And so a lot of us <laughs> have soul contracted or just have things in our experience that make us pick up on, okay, this person obviously has childhood trauma or they're having things going on with people pleasing or codependency. It's just very easy to pick up on because we have experienced a lot of that within us. And so that's why we resonate with those people, right? Another reason is pattern recognition. I come across a lot of empaths and neurodivergents that see the pattern in the big web when people come and talk to them about things. It's like, okay, I can see what's going on in your life and how all these things correlate to one another. And these are the steps <laughs> that you need to do to get out of this cycle, right? Because a lot of us have gotten out of those ourselves. Or we know the tools because we have that big uh, well of knowledge and wisdom. A lot of you in here right now, and I'm sure people watching in, this, in the future, are healers. And if you are tapped into your multidimensional self, you know that this is not the first incarnation that you have been a healer. So it's not just what you've learned here. It's continuous experience. <laughs> and so it's easy for us to roadmap for people. So lantern carriers, this is what I was talking about when people can like 
viscerally feel what you have experienced and they feel safe like these safe spaces down here they feel safe in your energy field because they're like you get it you understand me or you understand me <laughs> right i'm trying to change my language in there but you understand them at a very very deep level even if you haven't lived through their exact experience you have been picking up on people's thoughts feelings and emotions like so much that you feel those things in your body, even if you haven't necessarily experienced it. Like if I'm talking to somebody about something that I haven't necessarily gone through, right? I feel those feelings that they feel in their body so that I can better understand them. But if you're constantly doing that, that's where the overwhelm comes out and the burnout and the exhaustion because your body <laughs> doesn't know the difference between what is somebody else's feelings, thoughts, and emotions, and yours, if we're not having those shielding and those boundaries and clearing our energy. So it's like double whammying your central nervous system. <laughs> okay. So a lot of times people come up to this and they're like, I know subconsciously, right? I know you have been in a deep, dark hole in your life and you got out. Can you please show me how to do that? That's what makes us incredible healers because a lot of us signed up to have these journeys to help a big collective of people get out of those dark holes, right? Intentional listeners. There are so many people in the population <laughs> that do not care what people are talking about. Like us empaths, like we are actively listening, like to every single word that you're saying and not just the word, like we're reading all of your micro shifts in your body language. We're listening to inflections. We're listening to how things like correlate with one another. We're listening to your like energetic auric field and whether you know something consciously or subconsciously, because I know everybody's had conversations with people before and you're like talking to them and they're not really understanding or understanding what you're saying. It's not like a judgment thing. It's just like that person may not be consciously aware of what you're tapping into with their subconscious. Like I'll have conversations with people. Sometimes I'm like, oh, do you see how this correlates to this? And they say, no, I don't. And it's because they didn't even know that this thing right here was a problem, <laughs> right? Or something that they need to work through. But you pick up on it because we're very good at the energetic signatures and the pattern recognition or doing it ourselves, right? We're also non-judgmental, especially as healers that are tapped into that, oh, I've been a healer for a long time. You have lived a lot of different incarnations as different beings and had different experiences and walked in a lot of different shoes. So you're like, who am I to judge? I've been this and done this and had this and not done this, right? Like, who am I <laughs> to say anything about how you're living your life or what you're doing? Now, obviously not like evil stuff, right? But a lot of times people have never felt that before. They have never felt someone holding zero judgment against them, especially empaths and light workers that are like newly waking up. <laughs> Like you might be the first person and this, this class here is a little more advanced, right? But th if they meet you, <laughs> they might have like a period where they're like telling you their whole entire life because you're the first person that's allowed them to do that in a safe space. It's like um, when you get around neurodivergence and you don't mask, like, let's say I'm in a conversation and I'm not doing that that other neurodivergent person is like, oh my gosh, I don't have to mask around you. And you can just see their entire being shift, right? And so that's another gift of being an empath is like creating that safe space. And I say that's a gift in and of itself is creating safe spaces for people. Sometimes we only think of like gifts as um, psychic abilities, <laughs> okay? But like leadership is an ability, um, teaching people confidence, uh, accountability is a superpower. Like sometimes we don't recognize that within self. So if you have this ability of creating safe space, that is one of the most beautiful gifts that you can offer somebody. Now, sometimes people take advantage of these things, <laughs> right? And we'll get a little bit deeper into that in the next in the next one. Okay, so this is this is where we have non-equal energy exchanges. So. 
Has anybody ever, ever experienced where somebody wants to come and have a conversation with you and is asking for your advice and you're giving them solid advice and it's going like this, like you can feel in your deep core, they are not internalizing what you're saying. They're just trying to like trauma dump, which I get. And we've all done that before. Okay. <laughs> but they're just trying to unload on you. And then it temporarily makes them feel better and it makes you feel awful. That is because that is not an equal energy exchange. They are pulling from your light saying, oh, let me make you feel better temporarily, right? It's like a conversation that somebody keeps having with you and then doesn't do anything about it. Like a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And they're just like, can you believe this? They're doing it again. And like you try to explain the cycle to them. They just keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And like no judgment because we've all, you know, been there. But this is where we have to be really careful with like narcissists or people that like gaslight. Like you have this very high vibration and high frequency and people feel better in your energy field. But when we're giving, 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 and it's not equal, we feel awful, not just like spiritually and emotionally and mentally, but like phys like all around burnt out. Now, an equal energy exchange doesn't always have to be a payment. I was talking about this other, the, the other day. Like it's a healer or a coach. Maybe you're offering your services to people. So people paying you to do that is one type of exchange. Another type of exchange is if this person gives you back advice or listens to you when you need it. Right. Not just a taker, but also a giver back. Equal energy exchange. Or maybe you are new to energy healing or coaching, right? And you are giving someone this advice and they are really internalizing it and taking it in and you can feel like, oh, they're going to go do something with that, right? You are practicing your skills on them and they are giving you feedback by doing the thing or you knowing that it's resonating with them, right? So that is also an equal energy exchange, <laughs> Uh, I have some friends that I will talk to about some really, really heavy trauma stuff that I have been through in life. And then they'll do the same to me. And I don't ever feel burnt out. Like I could talk about some really heavy stuff. Okay. <laughs> but then I go out into public and somebody's doing that to me and like dumping and I'm trying to give them advice and they're not really intentionally listening. And it makes me feel awful afterwards because I am sharing light on something, but then not getting back in return. I'm not saying you need to get something in return for that, but you only have so much time and energy a day. Like you can't, you can't utilize that on everyone and everything because then your cup is just empty all the time. Especially if you run a business like myself, <laughs> if I was out doing that for people constantly and just giving, 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 then when it comes time to my clients or my like soul friends, I don't have anything to give to them. And then I don't have anything to give to me. So you have to be really mindful of like, is this relationship I have equal? And I know that we can't always just exit relationships, right? Sometimes we've been friends with somebody for 20 years or we've been married for a long time or, you know, what you have grown kids that do this, <laughs> like whatever, but you can start setting boundaries, right? One of the greatest things that has helped me on my journey is when people are talking to me and I know that they are not going to, they just want a band-aid and they're not listening. I say, wow, I'm so sorry you're going through that. And then I leave it at that. I don't dig in. We have a natural tendency to want to get all of him somebody subconscious, <laughs> okay? And root around in there and figure out what that web is because it's fun. Like I'm sure everybody feels that way. Like it's fun to be like a Sherlock Holmes and help somebody through those things. But that takes a massive amount of energy to read people at that deep level. Like it just does. <laughs> to root around in all those things. And you're taking a lot of mental energy as well of like connecting all those dots. So we need to save that for people who are giving back to us too in some type of way, right? Okay, seeing under, oh, yes, I forgot. Okay, so saying, I am so sorry you're going through that and leaving it there. 
because maybe it's not your job to help them. Maybe somebody else is meant to help them. Maybe their higher self is like, you aren't supposed to be doing this. That person needs to go figure this out on their own because like healers are great. We love them in coaches. Sometimes you need to figure out your own stuff. Like somebody spoon feeding you, right? And then you not doing anything with it is not teaching you that lesson. So ask yourself, like, is this my responsibility? And we're going to get into that a little bit more later, like why we think it's our responsibility. <laughs> but it's not your responsibility to help everyone, right? Like there's a lot of layers there. Okay, seeing under trauma. So this is why we pull in narcissists and uh, gaslighters and people that take our energy like that a lot of times is because when you look at somebody, you can see underneath all the trauma that they've been through. Like you understand why that person is like they are. And I don't say that like judgmentally, but just like why they're in this space of life. Like you get it. But there's so many layers of things like over that, that person may not ever meet you on that plane as you see them, right? Like you can see somebody's inner child within them. Like this happens a lot. Like in my work, I can see <laughs> somebody's inner child and like what happened to them and why they're hurting. But that person's consciousness level, or maybe they soul contracted where they don't want to work on those things, right? Like, have you ever met somebody and they're like, yeah, I know what I need to work on, but I don't care. I don't want to. Just because you can see it <laughs> doesn't mean that that person's connecting with you like that. That's why um, sometimes we fall in love with somebody's like, quote unquote, potential. Like we can see where they would be if they worked on these things, but that doesn't mean they're going to, and it doesn't mean they have to, and it doesn't mean it's your responsibility to get them there either. I know I'm talking fast. I want to make sure I get through everything. I'm going to check the chat really quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, so many times I've had an entire relationship that were like this. I can't hear you now. I can. Oh, can y'all hear me? Well, y'all let me know so I make sure I don't keep just talking. <laughs> Let's see. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I, we have our beautiful mirror here. So polarizing as mirrors, as light workers and empaths, we are mirrors to people's stuff and to each other. Like an empath light worker is going to be a mirror to me of the things that I have unhealed, right? Like they, sometimes people like trigger you things in you for, for you to heal. So if you have somebody that is not really doing like a self-awareness journey, or diving within themselves very deeply, they don't like us, <laughs> okay? They do not want to be around us because we make them look at those things. Like you can be having a conversation. You're like, well, what about this and this and this? And they are always like, eh, whatever, <laughs> right? Or they, they get triggered around you because you're making them face those shadows. Even if you're not verbally speaking, your energy field is very repelling to people that like don't want to be on that journey, which can make you feel very paranoid. It can make you think that people don't like you. It can make you feel like people are looking at you funny. And this is a, this is something that I've had to work on and heal like very significantly because when I would go out in public, I'm like, is there something wrong with me? Like people seem to really not like me. And they make funny glances at me. They look at me funny, right? Now, sometimes we're picking up on their subconscious beliefs about themselves, <laughs> okay? But if you are newer to being an empath, you think they're thinking about you because you can pick up on their thoughts, feelings, and emotions and what's going on in their subconscious. You're psychically reading them and they're having those thoughts about themselves, Sometimes this is projections though. Sometimes you have like really low self-confidence and self-esteem. So you're assuming that's what they're doing. Nine times out of 10, people are thinking about themselves. Like we're all in these little reality bubbles and we're all analyzing constantly and saying like, am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? Am I talking loudly? You know, am I making enough eye contact? <laughs> 
they're doing that too. But if you are picking up on their subconscious beliefs and interpreting it as them doing it to you, that can make you feel paranoid. So you have to really get good at deciphering, are they just being repelled by me because I'm making them look at this dark stuff? Not dark stuff, but y'all know. <laughs> like these shadow pieces, we'll call them that shadow pieces. <laughs> um, or is it my own subconscious thoughts, right? Of like what I think other people are thinking of me. It's a lot to like unlayer, but it gets easier to detect which is which when you're holding this perspective of, okay, let me look and see what this really is, right? But because I, and before we move on, I used to have horrible, horrible, horrible self-esteem. So when people were looking at me in public, I was assuming that they were looking at me negatively. And sometimes I were because, you know, the light worker thing, but a lot of times it was they're looking at me because I'm a bright shining light in the room and I'm way different than everybody else. Like, look, <laughs> I'm way different, especially I live in like a very conservative town and I don't look like everybody else and I don't dress like everybody else. And so people look at me and they're like, oh, <laughs> right. You have a very bright, shiny auric field. And when people, when you go into the store like CVS or Walgreens, people are like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> right so it's not always negative thoughts I assumed they were looking at me negatively but that was my own confidence and self-esteem stuff all right so this has very much helped me on my journey so I used to assume that everybody just wanted my help <laughs> okay or needed my help because I had a savior complex running like I said before it's not your job to help everyone and like sometimes somebody's higher self was like, you don't need to do that. Please stop. Like they're not going to do anything. <laughs> so I make it a point now that when I can feel somebody subconsciously asking me for advice, I take a second if it's not like a client. Right. But I take a second and I ask that person's higher self, should I talk to them about this? And when you do that, we're kind of like bypassing over. <laughs> And that higher self is going to tell you yes or no, because that higher self is at a much like higher consciousness level and they know what's best for that person. So you don't have to say it out loud because you might look kooky doing that. <laughs> okay. But you can ask in your mind, like very quickly, do I, should I talk to that person? It will save you a lot of time and effort. Okay. People pleasing. This is a big one with impasse because we think it's like our personal responsibility <laughs> to help everyone around us because we have this toolkit that not everybody has, right? Like sometimes, like I said, we're very isolated from one another. <laughs> and so you don't meet a lot of other impasse and you do have these really special gifts and anybody can be an empath. You can, you can learn to tap and tune into your empathic abilities like anybody. Just some of us are already born right out the gate or we have lived through trauma, or this is something we love to like learn more about ourselves and to utilize for like energy healing, right? People pleasing most of the time comes from childhood, from some type of trauma that you have incurred. That might be a parent or like a guardian who is always constantly holding you to like too high of expectations or telling you you're not good enough or you've lived in like very chaotic households. And so you've had to learn how to make everyone else around you happy so that you are safe. And when I say you are safe, I don't mean just physical abuse. Like that's one facet, right? Maybe you have a parent or a guardian that is emotionally abusive or neglectful or is dumping on you all the time right or expecting you to help shift their mood that is also a safety measure of <laughs> making sure that you are energetically okay and we don't always do this just with our words like you can be trying to frequency change the whole entire room because you're picking up on everyone's micro shifts 
and like the wavelengths in their moods, that takes an extreme level of psychic and energy reading, especially when you have multiple people in a home. And when that is happening and you're trying to do that as a safety mechanism, your fight or flight is all the way turned on. Your essential nervous system is so activated because you're like, I got to stay out of danger. I got to stay out of danger. I got to stay out of danger. <laughs> okay. It's, it's really scary, especially when like you're a young, small child. Right. And then when you are in that like adolescent stage, like from a psychology standpoint of like birth to like seven, eight, nine years old, your personality is really being molded and like set. And so if you are learning, Hey, doing this, making everyone happy keeps me okay and safe. That is how you will function for the rest of your life until you start actively working on like deconstructing that. So then it starts rolling over into relationships with like partners or your friends or career with your bosses. It can really extend out like very far and it can bleed into like perfectionism tendencies, even with self, right? Because you had people telling you like, oh, you're not good enough or you're the best. That's the other side of the coin of like, you're so awesome. You always get A's, right? And like, that's great. We love that. <laughs> but if you're constantly like, pushing a child, then whenever they do something that's like, quote unquote, subpar to them as an adult, it destroys you inside because you have these expectations that are like so up here, right? So it doesn't always have to be people pleasing isn't always like outside of you, inside <laughs> and your expectations of self. Okay, so reaching outside of ourselves. So one of my greatest fears in life was being alone because I had huge abandonment issues from my mom and never meeting my dad. And then I was adopted by my grandparents and they did the best that they could, <laughs> but just a lot of abandonment things going on. And so I would people please as a way to keep people around me. I didn't care who they were. Just as long as people were near me because I couldn't be alone with my thoughts and my emotions. I would have that savior complex to vicariously live through other people and help them so I wouldn't have to look at myself and the things that I had going on with my confidence and self-esteem. The issue <laughs> is also being neurodivergent. I was wearing a mask all the time. And being like a chameleon and showing everyone like a presentation of who I was. People pleasing. That's a safety mechanism that you're, you have learned in childhood of I will mold myself to who I need to be with this person. Not like a necessarily like in a manipulative way, but like I'll mold myself to who this person wants me to be so that I have friends or I have a relationship or I get along at work. Right. But that traverses into adulthood as well so what happens is we start building a reality around ourselves that is not in alignment with us and we don't actually enjoy because everything around us is resonating with our mask right then you start to get lost in your mask and you forget who you are you're like I don't even know like when you start to break that paradigm down it's like I don't even know what I like I, like none of these people resonate with me. <laughs> I don't like this job. That happened to me, like on my spiritual awakening journey. Like I started everything in my life started <laughs> dropping off. It was a huge tower moment, but like, I didn't want any of that. It's all this stuff and relationships that I had built around me because of that mask. Right. And it's really scary unmasking. Like when you first start doing it, like, I'm not going to say it's easy peasy, <laughs> right. You have to do it in, like small increments to reach teach yourself that you are safe, that what was happening in childhood isn't happening right now, right? And if we're in some type of like narcissistic relationship, that's a little bit different. Like we, we do need to create like actual physical safe spaces to deconstruct those things, right? So reaching outside ourselves. So I had a whole bunch of relationships in my life where people were constantly taking from me, like just eating my energy. And 
I started to build resentment, not towards those people necessarily, but like that cycle that I was in with them where they were just taking, 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 and I was giving, giving, giving. But I had the realization one day that the only reason they were doing that is because I was allowing it. Now, this is different than like an abusive relationship. That is not what I'm saying. Just (laughs) right. But this is like friendships or, you know, whatever bosses. I was allowing that to happen because I was not holding boundaries. Because I was like, okay, I just have to do what I need to do to get through. When I started holding boundaries with people and not allowing that anymore and saying, no, I don't have time and energy for that. All of a sudden, all these people started to fall out of my life because they were resonating with my mask and allowing them to do that. And it wasn't their fault either because that's the type of relationship we had. (laughs) Like, it's not their fault. It's just, it is what it is. And so when I stopped doing that, all of a sudden, all these people like disappeared and it made room and space for new people to come in where I had equal energy exchanges with them. And even then, like I have to like constantly check my relationships in my life and not just like friends and family, but like everything relationship to everything, because I have to make sure people pleasing isn't coming into play. Like sometimes I don't want to do so like. Sometimes you don't want to do something, but you're doing it out of obligation as a safety mechanism. <laughs> so I have to constantly like run it through my own filter because that's like a very deep core wound that I've had to heal through of, am I doing this because it's people pleasing, right? So when we're doing things, we really need to ask ourselves that, like, why am I doing this? Do I actually want to do this? Is this an equal energy exchange? And if it's not, then we need to reevaluate. Uh, those relationships too, that I had because of my fear of loneliness, I was like, okay, well, at least I have some people around me. Those relationships were actually making me feel lonelier because I'm like, they don't get me. They don't understand, or they don't understand me on the level of which I understand them. And it's because they saw my mask and that's what they were friends with not actually who I am, like at a deep core soul level, but it's scary healing these things because there is a time period sometimes where you don't have anybody because you're meant to recalibrate and find yourself. We'll get into that more in a second. Let me check here. Okay. Such a habit. I'm always in fight or flight. So yeah, it's it. As impasse, we have like a tendency to like be in that be in that um state. Okay. All right. So we talked about trauma response. So I had a huge tower moment in my life. And I'm not saying anybody watching this, you're gonna go through this. This is my personal experience, but I know that there's a lot of impasse that have been through this and light workers, energy healers. So there was a year in my life when all this stuff started deconstructing. And because my greatest fear was being alone, the universe, okay, was me, (laughs) like a higher version of me, right? Took everything out of my life, like everything, like my job, um, I stopped going to school and now like, I see why everything happened, but like my family stopped talking to me, uh, all my friends disappeared and like, I was alone, except for my son, (laughs) for a year. Like, nobody resonated with me. And, like, nobody was on the same wavelength or, like, understood what I was talking about. I had one friend, but she was also at the beginning stages and was going through it, too. (laughs) And so we couldn't really, like, help one another necessarily through it except say, yeah, this sucks. (laughs) Um, But I see why that happened because I kept on putting off my self-love journey And I kept just sweeping all this trauma and confidence and self-esteem and was like, I'll get to that later. Nobody has time for that. Like, it's fine. And the universe said, okay, well, this is what's going to happen then. (laughs) And so I'm very thankful for that because on the other side, I found myself. I fell in love with myself. I worked on my confidence and self-esteem. I stopped caring what other people thought. Like, and I'm not saying it happened overnight. Like it was a long journey, (laughs) but I was very solid in self, but the only way I got there was to isolate 
Right. And I'm not saying you need to do that necessarily, but this is for people that are on that journey right now. It's okay because on the other side of that is people that you resonate very deeply with and have energy exchanges with and a career that you love (laughs) because you know what you deserve and you won't take any less than because you have this relationship with yourself now and you're your best friends and you are number one. Self-care and self-love is the most important thing there is because how your internal state is, is how everything outside of you is reflected. And so when you have like this radical level of self-love, what kind of people do you pull in? You pull in people that also have that within them. (laughs) And so everything shifts, right? But it's scary taking that like leap into the unknown and the void space because we don't always know what's on the other side. But most of the time it's a lot better. It's just a little rocky going through that. (laughs) Okay. So negative vibes in the room. Let me check my time here. Perfect. Negative vibes in the room. So empaths and light workers, when you're still learning about your abilities, it's very overwhelming going out in public. Like Walmart, the grocery store, um, even being at work, like just being around people in general. Because when you are a child that has lived through trauma and chaos, your natural response as an empath and light worker, is to find all of the negative vibrations in the room. Like you have taught yourself to do that as a safety mechanism. And I used to do this. I would go into Publix, okay? And I would have a horrible time when I'm in there. And I would feel exhausted afterwards and like burnt out and stress and fight or flight. That's because I was doing an energetic scan of everyone that I saw. What about this person and this person and this person, this person, and just reading their auric fields. Not only was I reading everyone in the room, I was also reading the the whole building of like, what is the energy that's going on in here? That's why sometimes when we go to Walmart, if you have a Walmart, it rattles your brain (laughs) because there's a lot of people in, there's a lot of people in Walmart first. And it's very chaotic energy. A lot of people are upset in there. It's very frenzy. It's very like, you know, just uh, shaky energy. And then when you go in there, you're looking at all these people and trying to read them. And so you're overwhelming yourself by, by doing that. Your crown chakra and your third eye chakra are like way, 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 way too open. You're doing that because you feel like you're in danger. Not like somebody's going to, you know, like... (laughs) It gets you, but energetic danger. You're like, who's going to yell at me? That's from childhood. You have an inner child in there that was yelled at and is like, I need to see who in here is scary and dangerous and could potentially be a threat. And I'm not saying don't be safe. Okay. (laughs) Like sometimes people are like, actually, you know, somebody you don't need to be around, but like typically, like when we go out in public, you're good. You're just still in fight or flight mode because you're like, what if, right? So this is where like healing those inner children within us is so important because when you, when you go out, you can ask yourself, is it me that is worried and anxious about everyone in here or is it my inner child? And when you do that exercise, most of the time it is your inner child and you can start talking to them and say like, hey, we're actually okay. Like, I know that you're scared right now and that happened to us in the past, but like, we're good. I'm an adult now. I've got us. I'm protecting us. I need you to relax a little bit. And something that I have found that has like really helped me is, let's say we're going into a pharmacy like Walgreens or CVS, okay? Your natural response is going to be find all the negative vibrations. What about instead before you go into that store, say, you know what? I'm going to intentionally, consciously look for things in here that bring me joy and happiness with my inner child because it's coming from your inner child. Hey, let's go find something that makes us happy immediately upon going in that store. 
So maybe you go to like the jewelry aisle or the toy aisle or the makeup aisle or like whatever that is for your greeting card aisle and you find something as an anchor point. Because once you start pointing your attention and energy at something, you get more of that. So if you're going in the store saying like, who's going to hurt me in here, energetically hurt me, right? That's what you're going to look for. But if you start out immediately with, we're going to find something that brings us uh, brings us joy and helps us smile. <laughs> okay. Then your inner child wants to find more of that. And you want to find more of that. I cannot tell you how much like this has changed my life because I go in stores now, people smile at me all the time. And I have very lovely interactions with people because I'm not looking for that stuff. It's not even in my reality scape. And if I do see something like that, I'm like, okay, well, that person's having a bad day or that person, you know, is doing their own thing in their own reality bubble. That has nothing to do with me and it's not affecting me. And I tell my inner children inside, we're okay, we're good. I know that person's upset and that person's yelling or that person, you know, whatever that has nothing to do with us. Let's go find something else. I do that constantly. I'm always looking for things that bring me joy and happiness because it keeps me in that vibration and frequency. Your subconscious works like a um, computer. So if you give it a job, it will constantly do that for you. And I'm not saying that this, like, let me, I'm going to burn this instance really quick. I'm not saying that uh, this is something that changes overnight because to reprogram your subconscious and your inner children's like behavioral patterns, it takes consistent going back and doing that. But there is a tipping point, like a precipice point, gaining mo momentum where your brain and your inner children finally get it. Like they, they understand, understand. <laughs> they understand you're keeping them safe. Nothing's actually happening to them. And when you go out, you're actually looking for fun and magical and whimsical stuff. We're not looking for somebody who's angry or for somebody who's grieving or for somebody who's sad or for somebody who's like agitated. That's not our business. Not our business. <laughs> you stay in your own energy field, right? So this is kind of like a shortcut with your inner children. Because I know it sounds very up. Uh, or I'll say this, sometimes it's easier to take care of somebody else, right, <laughs> than it is ourselves. That's why I love working with inner children, because we're coming in as like the parent and the coach and the higher self to them, but it's actually us, but it's a different consciousness level. So it's like, okay, I'm going, I am going to be the leader and I'm going to help everybody. All the inner kids are younger versions. Let me teach you and show you a new reality and in doing that you all shift together because now the inner kids are healed you heal in the time and space that you're at and then that shifts you over to a new higher self version of yourself right to to connect to your heart we don't have to get all, like too far on this but <laughs> to connect to your higher self if you learn how to be the higher self of your younger versions and you constantly do that you have something to springboard off of and it constantly keeps you moving forward because there's always more stuff to backboard heal off of, right? Okay. Ah, uh, my spouse is listening. I love this. Oh, yay. <laughs> Tell me to <the> hey. <laughs> okay. So masking, this, this also causes us to mask because we're like, we're so, we're different. <laughs> okay. People who are neurodivergent, and who are empaths and lightworkers, we are not like the general public. <laughs> okay, we're a little, we're a little odd duck, <laughs> and we don't go with the flow. And when I say that, like what, what a, even is like reality or like normal? You see what I'm saying? But sometimes, like I said, we're isolated from one another, so it makes us seem like we're the odd one out, the rainbow sheep. Okay, it's not really that. It's a lot of neurodivergence and empaths and light workers have had to mask for so long because of this trauma response and because the way society is set up, it's not always like the most advantageous for us. We don't even see each other because we mask. This is something that like I have been really digging into <laughs> is if you're masking and another neurodivergent or empath is masking, 
you're so good at it. You don't even see each other. You don't resonate with one another because you're not being authentic. So you cannot see each other. All you're seeing is like a facade lens of that person. And so it takes you sometimes being the brave, bold one and saying, I'm not going to mask like that or as much if you're still, if you're a person working on that. And when you do that, it allows other people to find you because they're like, oh, that's somebody who's like me and I can see them. Sometimes you're the very first person they've been around that hasn't masked. So there are actually a lot of us out there. Like I really only have neurodivergent people in my experience now, like friends, clients, I can hone in on somebody very quickly. Like, Oh, you got ADHD (laughs) or you're an empath, even though they didn't tell me anything about themselves. Okay. But that's because I don't mask or I'm, I'm always working on that. Okay. (laughs) But I, I let those shields down and those guards down so I can find my people. That's how you find your soul tribe. And there are a lot of us that have been on this journey for a long time and it's our responsibility Okay, (laughs) to be that leader for other people. And you can find people very easily when you're not doing it, right? Like you you attract them to you (laughs) because they're like, oh my God, this is somebody I don't have to do this with. (laughs) Um, So just a mental note. (laughs) All right. Okay, so we all know, and this is something that we all hear all the time, but it's so important is grounding your energy. So if you are taking on somebody else's thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and sometimes you want to do that. Like for me, with you know people that I work with, I need to feel their feelings and their subconscious thoughts. But I have done this so much that I can feel it without absorbing it. I can observe it and feel it without absorbing it and feeling it, right? There's two different things. And so if you are going out in public, And let's say that you, you know, go to Pizza Hut, (laughs) okay, and you're feeling great, like you are jazzed, you are so happy, you are thriving, you go in Pizza Hut and have your interactions or whatever, and then you come out and you feel awful. We need to ask ourselves, how was I feeling before this? Because if you're feeling icky and yucky, you think that you had an energy shift, but most of the time it's somebody else's energy field affected you. And when you can pull away from that a little bit and observe it and be like, okay, that's not my stuff. (laughs) I'm releasing that. Or you talk to somebody who's being like very confrontational or angry. And then all of a sudden you feel awful. You got to take a second to be like, okay, that's their energy fields. That's not mine. I'm releasing that. Right. Saying that over yourself intentionally with I am releasing this energy that is not serving me is like half of grounding (laughs) like your intentions for things shift the etheric field it shifts the akasha field it shifts your energy field and other people's energy fields or like how you're interacting with their energy fields we need to say I was not feeling like this before this interaction I'm releasing that stuff that's not mine right And we all know grounding practices. Like, I don't want to have to get into that too deep. (laughs) Put your hand on a tree, doing some like uh, exercise, like stretching. Your cortisol and your hormone, like your cortisol hormones do not just go away. I find this with like so many empaths and light workers. I'm like, okay, well, what are you doing to get this stuff out? And they're like, nothing. And I'm like, well, that's why one of the reasons that you feel so bad, not like physically sick, but energetically sick. Is because you have so much stress hormone rushing through your body and it just sits there and then it crystallines it hardens and becomes dense and then it becomes disease and anxiety and depression. And I'm not saying that's the only reason for anxiety and depression, but I've seen that a lot with people like us. It's because you're just layering all of this icky, yucky energy in your body. And I'm not saying you need to go work out for an hour right? Like we don't have to go pump iron hardcore, but (laughs) we have to do something where we're getting our heart rate up a little bit, going on a really brisk walk, 
dancing for 10 minutes, doing 10 minutes of stretching with the intention of I am releasing my energy, right? It will reset you. It will get that icky, yucky stuff out of your body. But if you're not doing that, it just makes you feel like really tight and constricted and tense and like too big for your body. You have to do something to get this stuff out every single day. (laughs) Okay. Even if it's just for 10 minutes, it will make your life completely different. (laughs) Okay. Clearing your field. That's part of that. I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can clear your field. Um, But my main thing is like, this is, this is like empath 101. And even I need to be reminded of it sometimes of like, are you grounding? Are you clearing this icky yucky stuff out of your body? And even if you're like a empath who's like very tapped into themselves, you're still picking up on frequencies from everyone and everything and the collective. Like we don't always just pick up on individuals. We pick up what's going on up here on the greater psychic field. So that's why sometimes we usually be in the house. And then all of a sudden you get this huge wave of sadness over you. That's probably because you picked up on something that's going on on the other side of the world where a huge collective of people are going through something and you as a light worker are helping transmute that. So if you just get sad or angry all of a sudden for no reason, ask yourself, is this me or is this something coming from the global collective? (laughs) Okay, I have to do that sometimes because afterwards I'm like oh yeah that's not my stuff okay yes you learned to do that oh it's okay uh if if you're just now popping in it's going to be recorded so it's okay (laughs) okay we're going to talk about processing your emotions because if you are an Aquarian like myself (laughs) or you have never been taught how to process your emotions or you have never been in a safe space to process your emotions and you've had to mask, right? It is a wild concept. It's like, I know how to observe them, but I don't know how to actually like feel them. So when we are, and that's vital for empaths and light workers because like your gift is feeling emotions. <laughs> and so if you are just taking on all this stuff or even your own emotions, right? And we are not processing them. It crystallines and hardens and becomes stress and anxiety and disease. We are energy emotion. Emotions, like we're supposed to channel them and let them go through, right? So what I have done that has helped me is you're going to have to feel these things in your body. Like when they say feel emotions, it means your central nervous system is going to get kicked on. Like if you're viscerally angry, (laughs) okay, or you are so incredibly sad or frustrated, you are going to have to actually feel that in your body. Like you might feel, you know, like sweaty, you might feel um, just uncomfortable in your body. It's actually like feeling that stuff. And so this is a little shortcut that I learned. So a lot of these unprocessed emotions from childhood have been layering and layering and layering and layering. And so the things that are actually making us upset and triggering us and behavioral patterns and cycles are coming from emotions from childhood that were never processed. If you are people pleasing or have low self-worth, perfectionism tendencies, those behavioral patterns or anything like that, if they came from childhood, your consciousness level is stuck at that childhood level. That's why you're still experiencing it. So you as the higher self can help them process through that. So let's say that um, I go to a family function. Okay. Let me raise the water here. Let's say I go to a family function, get triggered. <laughs> Okay, that's because you have memories that are tied with emotions and PTSD with those people sometimes. And so when you get around them, it triggers you from childhood and it zaps you back into that childlike state of consciousness. And when you get home, you're like, why did I act like that? 
Why did I get upset like that? Why did that experience happen? That's because you jump back in consciousness, right? So let's say I get triggered, angry, right? If I stuff that down, <laughs> and I'm just like, whatever, it's going to come out eventually. It's going to come out as a mental break. It's going to come out as you having road rage. It's going to come out as you snapping at your kids. It is going to come out eventually, but we don't always see that those things are correlated, right? So this is what I do. Emotions are like little children. They are trying to get your attention to tell you something, to alert you to something. They're like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and if you ignore them like a child, they will get louder, right? Pitch fit. <laughs> and so when I get home from the event, I sit and I say, hey, anger, I see you. Thank you so much for showing me that you're here. I love and honor you and we're going to feel this through our body and when we're done I'm going to hold your hand while we do it anger like a child I'm going to hold your hands and when we're done we're going to go do something else if you do that for like five or ten minutes and let that just run through you and you're kind of doing it from an objective place but you're still feeling it you're doing it of like okay my child inside of me is triggered I need to help them process through this right now, because if not, it's going to get worse. So we are going to sit here and do it together. Feel it through your body. And then you feel so much better afterwards. And I'm not saying you won't have like a sad whole day. Okay. Or an angry whole day, but it's not an angry or sad whole week or three months or six months. Like if you can just do that activity, it, makes it so much shorter and then you start doing it more and more and more and then your emotions and your inner children are like oh okay it feels safe in my body to do this you're retraining your inner children not retraining I shouldn't say it, re like helping <laughs> your inner children learn it's okay to do this it's okay to feel this way and I've got you and we're going to process it and you're good and you're safe and we're okay now sometimes you don't have time to do that like I was going to go to an event and I got in a disagreement with somebody in my life, triggered the mess out of me, like whole body went into fight or flight. And I went outside and I took a second and I said, okay, anger, I see you right now and you are completely valid. And this is something from younger years that was triggering me, like a younger version of me with this person. And I said, you are so valid for showing me this. And I love you. We don't have time to do this right now because we're about to go to an event. But I promise you that I will come back to this later and we will process it. And I did. I got home that night and I said, okay, anger, let's go. <laughs> and I said, you can scream as loud as you want in here and you can curse and you can just throw a fit. <laughs> okay. And I will be here for you while you do it. And I felt that so viscerally in my body and I was crying my eyes out. And then, you know what? Afterwards, I was like, thank you. I felt so much better. And I didn't let that anger consume me for the next week. And I didn't let it overtake all my thoughts and ruminate on that stuff because I processed it and then it was gone. But I had to come back. When I told anger, I will come back to you. If I don't, you are creating mistrust with that emotion and your inner child. That version of me that got triggered was in my 20s because of the person that I was having a confrontation with. And it was basically me saying to her like, hey, we don't have time for that right this second, but I promise you I will come back to you. And I did. But if I didn't, that's when things get wonky. Because <laughs> she'd be like, oh, you, you, you didn't. Right. And that's when they start suppressing things. And so if you say you're going to do it, you got to do it. <laughs> okay. But treating, treating your emotions like an inner child will change, will be a game changer because most of that stuff that's triggering you is coming from childhood and not always, but a lot of times or young adult. Like for me, that was me at like 23, 24 years old. That was getting triggered. All right. Oh, perfect. We are making good time here. All right, I am going to pause this 
for just a second so I can run to the restroom. And so I will be right back. Okay, so even even with me going to the bathroom just now, <clears throat> in the past when I was doing workshop, and that's kind of like a little side thing, in the past when I was doing workshops or lives, I would try and hold out, I know that sounds like whatever, hold out to go to the bathroom because I'm like, oh, well, I'm teaching and all these people are in here and, you know, whatever, that's people pleasing. That is putting other people's needs above mine. And like having like unrealistic expectations and that's unrealistic expectations of others. Like people got to use bathroom. Okay. But also I needed to get up and like refresh and restretch because the people that are in here right now, like I'm also like energetically reading, like not y'all like individually intentionally. Right. But like group reading the energy. And so even me, I have to get up and like clear my energy field for that. <clears throat> Very important. Okay, so this is where being an empath comes in as a superpower. Water is very important for empaths and light workers too to keep your channel clear. So it is true that we feel into everything very intensely. And usually um, when you're first starting on your journey, it's negative things because you have that trauma response. But when you do these things and process your emotions and work on these exercises like with your inner children of like telling them like hey we are actually safe then you start picking up on things that are joy bliss happiness excitement peace freedom those are the things you start hyper focusing on that's where manifestations come in we start pulling in different type of people that actually like resonate with us and are on the same wavelength and have that equal energy exchange we start having experiences and outcomes coming towards us that are resonating with our new energy fields of looking for different things, right? It is true that if you're talking to somebody and they have a lot of unhealed stuff, you are, and we all have unhealed stuff, but y'all, <laughs> but if they're like super angry or, you know, have stuff going on from childhood, they don't want to look at, you know, all that stuff, it can be very overwhelming. But on the opposite side of that, it can make you an incredibly great energy healer because you can pinpoint within people like, okay, well, this is going on. This is going on. This is going on. This is going on. Use your pattern recognition. And when you have an equal energy exchange with someone, it is the most fun thing ever to be a Sherlock Holmes and read and scan people and figure out what's going on and help them open their awareness and help them see things in new perspectives and change somebody's life, <laughs> okay? Like, it is the most fulfilling thing when I'm talking to a client or one of my friends, and I'm like, hey, what about this? Like, I see this within you. This is how everything connects. And they're like, oh my God. They're like, you just shifted so much within me from, from this because I can see what they can't see. And I can feel and find those little energetic signatures of how everything connects. So you being an empath and a light worker makes you like this incredible healer because you feel everything so viscerally, but it extends like past the healing stuff, like art and music. You feel that on an incredibly deep level. That's what makes us like so creative and innovative as well. Or like maybe you're neurodivergent and you like a million different things. You see that as a curse, but it's actually an amazing blessing because it makes you so innovative. Like you put things together that people don't see, like Nikolai Tesla or like Albert Einstein or like all these people, they don't fit in the normal society, like conform box. <laughs> okay. Like they expand and that's you too. You see so much like empaths and light workers see so much more of the world and in people than what people who aren't like that see. Whether you're doing it intentionally or not. But if you focus on the negative world and the trauma and we're, and we're not processing our emotions, yeah, 
you are going to have a really rough, rocky ride in life because you are feeling into the negativity of life way beyond what other people are. Like a sad song. That's why a lot of us can't watch scary movies or listen to like sad music because (laughs) it's way too intense. Like I don't watch scary movies because like I can't deal with that in my body. Uh, But like not saying don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) It's my own personal, right? Like I can't watch things like that. I can't listen to sad stuff because it affects my energy field. But if I focus on positivity and bliss and joy and happiness and peace and like all those things, boy, and that is like, (laughs) that's like the the magic. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Like you feel into those things so much more deeply than somebody who doesn't necessarily have those gifts. It's just a lot of times in past are focused on all of these things and it's not your fault it's nobody's fault it's like what happened in life it's like life experience and trauma that's where like healing your inner children (laughs) and this stuff and people pleasing and your confidence and self-esteem can literally create you a new reality because you're just shifting your focus over here that stuff's not bothering you anymore so now we're over here in manifestation lands okay so because we feel emotions, that's our, our, our gift, you can use that to manifest, okay? So let's talk about uh, money, because <laughs> money is a big one with people, and we'll be done here in just a second, and then we'll do the Q&A. So money, people say they want more money. Like, I work with people with manifesting, and they're like, I, I want to be more abundant and prosperous. Okay, are you stress and anxious though when you're thinking about money like are you going into fight or flight or you have stuff from childhood where you grew up in a lot of lack mentality or like you have a viewpoint that money is evil or like you know just like negativity hole with money so what happens when you want something and then you have negative vibrations towards it you're going to get more negative experiences from it so that's what keeps us in that lack cycle right with those behavioral patterns (laughs) because we say we want it but the subconscious is telling us otherwise so this is a shortcut that I have utilized very beneficial so what feelings do we want for money we want to feel safety security peace joy bliss happiness um expansiveness freedom right let's pick joy Okay, so if you are stressed and anxious about money over here and you're like, I want money to bring me joy, that is too far of a frequency gap. Your subconscious will not believe that. (laughs) Okay, so this is where we have to find a neutral middle ground. And so I want everybody in here, or if you're watching this later, we're going to close our eyes for a second and we're going to think about a memory that brings us joy. It can be an experience, it can be a person, it can be just any type of memory in your whole entire life that has brought you joy, even if it's momentarily. So we're all going to take a second. Whatever, don't overthink it too, like whatever comes up in your mind. Okay, we're going to feel into that memory like you were there, like really, like even if you can't picture things in your mind, okay, because like me, (laughs) we're going to feel into how we felt when we were there and experiencing that. So for me, it's uh, the birth of my son. Okay, now we can feel our heart space expanding and we're switching frequencies. Now, when we think about money, we're going to think about money now. And like, this is the feeling that I want. That's it right there. I want money to feel like how I just felt. You, when you do this, you are rewiring your neural networking. Because most of us have negative memories with money. When you attach something very positive you rewire that neural networking. Now your brain associates money 
with feeling like the birth of your son or whatever that is for you. You have to connect a new memory to whatever it is that you want to manifest. If you've been thinking about stress and anxiety with that thing. <clears throat> so it's like when people say like, oh, I want a new house. I don't know what that would feel like. Or I want a new car. I don't know what that would feel like. What emotion does that thing bring you? Because that's what you actually want. When you focus on the emotion instead of the material thing, the universe starts to bring you way more of things that you didn't even ask for because you really want the emotion, anything that brings you that emotion. So different opportunities and experiences start showing up that you didn't even know about or you didn't ask for because all you care about, okay, <laughs> what you care about is I just want to feel that. You can do that with literally any manifestation. If you want a new career, it's really stressful sometimes thinking about, well, how am I going to get that? You're trying to do that on a 3D plane, which is difficult. If you can get into that feeling or emotion beforehand, your body doesn't know the difference between a feeling that it's feeling right now and that being your actual now experience and reality than when you get that three months from now or whatever. Sink into that feeling with that memory that you already have, then switch over and say, that's what I want from that. You can do that with a whole assortment of emotions. You can layer them. <laughs> okay, thinking about money. When have you felt free? Think about that memory. When have I felt safe? Think about that memory. Then think about that money. Because you as an empath and a light worker, your superpower is feeling into emotions <laughs> and projecting that outside of yourself magnified beyond. That's why some of us live in such sorrow and negativity because we're focused on that because of the trauma and we get more of that amplified. But if you switch your internal vibration and frequency and work on that trauma stuff and the inner child healing and processing your emotions, we're shifting to a different life <laughs> because we're focused on what we actually want and not focus on what we don't want more of. But sometimes people don't make that correlation. They're like, well, a house would make me happier and money would make me ha happier, right? But you're having negative vibrations thinking about it. And so it's not coming because we're not embodying that frequency. What we're putting out is I don't have it and I'll never have it or it's stressing me out and making me anxious. Use this shortcut. <laughs> kind of like how when we were talking about uh, processing our emotions, if you process your emotions like that from more like that objective standpoint, but still feeling it, it helps you process them. Just like this shortcut helps you make that frequency jump from like, oh, I don't have it, I'm stressed to, oh, I know exactly what this feels like <laughs> and I want more of this. Okay, <laughs> so hopefully it made sense. Um, but that that's like your greatest gift <laughs> and manifestations are about the emotions. That is the fuel to bring those things in. That is working on an etheric field instead of a 3D dense field where you think something's going to take you five, five years to do. If you work from that etheric field up here and get yourself internally there first, it comes in like so much quicker <laughs> because your body is like, oh no, this is real. It's already happening. I'm already feeling it, right? And then that stuff starts to come down out of like the etheric plane into density a lot quicker. All right. Okay. So before we get into the q and I wanted to say if anybody needs some extra help with these things, if you need some extra support, uh, I do help with trauma healing and inner child healing, helping you tap into your magic and your spiritual abilities and your spiritual gifts. Um, if you're working on healing perfectionism, people pleasing, uh, your confidence and self-esteem, if you just want to release some of that like heavy trauma from your past, not just the childhood, but uh, you as a young adult, right? Or maybe you've been in some like narcissistic relationships and you need to get that stuff up out of your body. 
I have a technique that I have uh, put together and I help take you into the etheric field to meet with your inner child or your younger version. It's one thing for me to like say this to everyone and I figured it out. Like I figured out how to do this. So I don't ever want to take power away from somebody and say like, oh, you need somebody to do this for you or help you with it because you can do it. It's how much time and energy do you want to put into it? But you can't, <laughs> but it's different when you actually meet your inner children and your younger versions as a consciousness form. Like it's one thing to speak over yourself and it's one to actually meet them and see that they are real, that that is a living, breathing consciousness form inside of you, that you can help them release that energy, right? So I have individual programs or individual sessions <laughs> and I have a short-term program and a long-term program, depending on how much that you want to work through or how much you want to shed, how many layers you want to come off, right? So if you would like to set up any sessions, you can click this button down here. I'm ready to start. These are my socials over here, my Instagram and my TikTok. I would love for you to follow me over there. It's a fun community. And then my website is soulharmonymagic.com. All right. And then, so these are some extra resources that I put together for everyone. One is confidence, people-pleasing, inner child healing, abundance, understanding trauma, specifically from childhood and like how that affects us and how to uh, regulate your nervous system. And so these are all videos. And if you click on them, they will take you to the source. So I will be sending everyone the Google Slides after this. And if you're watching this on YouTube, if you look down in the uh, description down here, <laughs> it will have the link for the slides and everything's clickable. Okay, I'm going to check the chat here, but these are all videos that I have watched and have significantly shifted my journey. Like these, these are great, 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 great to watch. They go very in depth. The inner child healing one that I have down here, that is a video that I put together on working with your chakra system to heal your inner child. So we talk about how they both co <laughs> and how to heal things. Um, the rest of these videos are from outside sources, from some beautiful people that have helped me on my journey. <laughs> okay, because sometimes you need help from somebody. And that's what I was saying. You can do these things on your on your own. Don't ever let somebody tell you like you have to have somebody, but we only have so much time and energy. <laughs> sometimes we need help from somebody who's been there, done that. Uh, me too. You can say, I watch all these videos. <laughs> all right. So we're going to do Q&A now. Um, and so if anybody has any questions, if you will put them in the chat and then I'll read them and then we'll respond here. All right. Thanks. No clue what happened. I'll have to rewatch that part. How do we get those videos? Um, I'll send out the slides and then you can just click on, click on all the links and it'll take you over to, they're all YouTube videos that you can watch. Very easy access. Okay. If there aren't any questions or if there are questions, feel free to put them in the chat. What was everybody's biggest takeaway? That would help me with kind of uh, knowing for when I do these in the future to like build off of, <laughs> if that makes sense. If you want, if you want to share, don't feel like you have to though. And I appreciate everybody coming to the live and everyone who will be watching this in the future as well. And hopefully it was beneficial. These are all things that I have figured out within self for my own self-discovery and journey. <laughs> okay. But it's also things that I've seen within like clients that I work with and like just building that knowledge bank. And so it's not just from my perspective, like this is from working with tons of people and doing tons of psychology research like I um, have a background in psychology and that's like one of my biggest passions because we are multi-dimensional beings that can use support with energy healing but then we're also human beings that need help with like the mindset subconscious work right so psychology and energy healing are very 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 important that's why I like to blend both of them <laughs> okay the money thing was genius and so needed. Oh, good, good, good. It's a, it's a real game changer. 
<laughs> like it is great. I'm also going to be doing a, um, I know we talked about manifestation like a little bit here, but I'm going to be doing a specific manifestation workshop coming up too, where we get like real deep into those concepts. <laughs> okay. Really like your explanation of inner child work. Okay, great. When we're, and I'll talk about inner child really quick because that was kind of like a big theme here. Um, if we don't have any questions, your inner child, right? <clears throat> when I first started on my journey, people would talk about, oh, you need to heal your inner child. You need to heal your inner child. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it wasn't later until my journey until I started doing that. Cause I had like so much in my adult conscious mind that I needed to heal before I could even access that stuff. Because you can't help somebody else with tools you don't have yet. <laughs> right. Even yourself, like younger versions. And so I had to heal a lot of like my adult conscious mind. And then came the time where it was time to start working with the inner kids. So I want you to, or when, sometimes I talk to best. <laughs> sometimes in spirituality, people will say, you need to work on your inner child. So you just be talking to yourself. And like, it's not resonating or it feels weird because you're trying to talk to an inner child, right? There are so many different inner children inside of you and not even inner children. There's teens, there's adults. What happens is when you experience PTSD or trauma, you kind of get stuck at that consciousness level. That's what causes behavioral patterns and triggers, right? So let's envision that we have a five-year-old and a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old outside of us. Would you talk to them the same way? Would you give them the same levels of support? Would you give them the same type of advice? No, they don't even like doing the same things. So if you have a five-year-old in you that is uh, dealing with unworthiness because a parent told you you're not good enough, you're not going to speak to them the same way you would the 12-year-old. And so we have to pinpoint where these things happen and help them in those energetic timestamps. Like that might have happened to you at five and 15. You have to go back to the memory in the time of when you were five, help them heal from that, then go back when you were 15 and help them heal from that. And when you start doing that, <laughs> you start having all of these little consciousness versions inside of you. And so when you get triggered, you understand, okay, I know where this is coming from and I know who it's coming from. And it's a really cool like internal family system that you can build because like there are pieces of me that that I'm still working on healing with some like heavy stuff that happened to me. When I heal the easier version, <laughs> okay, they go in and help me heal that version that's like stuck way back there because I'm almost 33 years old. Now, I am at a way different consciousness level than I was when I was five, when this one thing happened around that time. It's easier to take one of my other inner children in with her than me just coming in and trying to talk to her because she feels safe with the other kids being there. Does that make sense? <laughs> and so if you have been kind of like struggling with the inner child thing, try pinpointing where something came from. Where did my people pleasing originate? How far back can I go with that? Then when you heal that, usually there's other layers. <laughs> but once you find that, like, let's say you're at 12, right? We're going to get in meditation and we're going to take a deep, deep breath in. And we're going to ask them, how old are you? What's your name? Sometimes they want to go by your name. Sometimes they want to go by a different name because sometimes there's trauma associated around your name. Maybe somebody has like been talking down to you and screaming your name at you when you're a child. Maybe they don't want to be called that because it's scary. And there's PTSD and emotion trauma tangled up together. So do you want to go by a nickname? <laughs> and sometimes they'll come out with something like left field, like Coco or princess or like whatever. Right. So call them that, find out how old they are. And then as the higher self, you come in and say, how can I help you heal? How are you feeling? What is going on? Now, when we're helping, and I didn't mean for this to turn into an inner child chat, but it's important. <laughs> when we are healing these very, very, very young versions of ourselves, you cannot go in just talking about trauma because that's very scary. 
and they've been hiding that stuff or not hiding, but they've been protecting that stuff for a very long time and protecting you from it. A lot of us who are empaths and light workers don't remember stuff from childhood because they, those kids within us don't want us to experience it twice. So they hide the memories, they suppress them. So you building a relationship with them and doing fun things, because a lot of us didn't have a whole lot of fun when we were younger because we were living in trauma. Uh, you doing fun things with them is a great way to start that relationship because most of us have issues with trust. And then we got that reiterated time and a time and time again with relationships that treated us poorly. But a relationship that you can give to your inner child is a relationship with you and them and re-teaching them, hey, not everybody's like that. I'm not. I'm coming in here to help you. I love you. Let me show you. You can trust me and I can trust you and we'll build this relationship. Most of us have like very severe trust issues and not our fault. <laughs> okay. And then we just got more examples and more examples and more examples. So you have to create those safe spaces within for those inner children to even feel safe enough to tell you about them or feel them. So asking that inner child first, what do you like to do for fun? Or what do you wish you could have done when you were when we were younger? One of the greatest gifts that you can give to your inner child is allowing them to use your body or experience something with you that they didn't get to or that they want to do. So like for me, my five-year-old loves coloring and she's not like taking over my consciousness, right? But I'm like, hey, you can pick the colors. You pick the coloring page. You do all this, right? When I did that specific activity one time, and we'll finish up here in a second. When I did that specific activity one time, I started trying to say, well, how about you do this? And how about you do this? And this would look better. And my higher self came in and said, don't do that. She is hurting so deeply from people telling her that what she's doing is not correct, that you doing that is passing on generational trauma to her and hurting her exactly how everybody hurt you. And so I had to be like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, you can color however you want. <laughs> okay, but in doing that, I healed that. I said, you do whatever you want. I love you unconditionally. Like, you're a rock star. And then I put that picture up on my refrigerator. And it's a reminder of like, we don't have to do things that other people tell us we need to do. I have a vivid picture in my mind. This is when I mean like we go through trauma sometimes and don't realize it's trauma. It doesn't always mean it's physical trauma. Okay. My mom, who I have abandonment issues with. Okay. Uh, or I had abandonment issues with. <laughs> She and I were in the car one time and I was coloring when I was about that age and I was like doing, you know, like whatever. And she was like, you need to stay inside the lines. That's not how you color. Like you're ruining the page and this is not what I bought that for. What I heard was you're not good enough and you need to do what everybody else does. And that I took that with me. <laughs> like beyond <laughs> right and so me going in and like being that mother figure to her and saying girl I don't care how you color this like have fun <laughs> right live your best life <laughs> that release a huge energy within me like I viscerally felt that come out of my body because I healed that moment of time where I was stuck in my childhood consciousness right that had changed how I functioned for the rest of my life. It's, it's deep stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I uh, love the inner child chat. Yay. I love to I talk about inner child all day long. <laughs> it's my favorite. When I started healing my inner children, that's when my whole entire spiritual awakening journey like shifted. Like everything. Because your inner children are also like having to do with your magic and whimsy and imagination and creation so like when you tap into them and start healing them everything shifts <laughs> because stress and anxiety and trauma strip you of all of that it strips you of your gifts it strips you of magic and synchronicities and whimsy and imagination 
So when you heal those things and connect with your inner children, now you're tapped back in to your multidimensional self. Okay. Uh, love the inner child chat. I'm so new to this. Thank you. My third eye is throbbing. Oh, I love the little star emojis. Okay. Well, I'm glad everybody enjoyed. I appreciate everybody uh, coming. Uh, and if you're watching this in the future, I hope you enjoy it as well. If anybody ever has any questions about the things I was talking about, or you need extra support, or extra resources, you can reach out to me on my website, soulharmonymagic.com. That is also my Instagram and my TikTok, Soul Harmony Magic. And you can message me on Instagram. All right. I hope everybody has a very magical and wonderful day and I will see y'all next time.